I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to the Root Cause Problem Solving, the Heart of a Lean Transformation. Uh, today's event, Lonnie Wilson, my colleague, and I will be talking with you for the next 45 to 50 minutes, and we want to encourage you to continue to ask questions and use uh, the question box area to provide your questions. We actually have two different uh, segments during this presentation where we'll uh, try to field some of those questions and answer them for you. And if we run out of time in that area, we'll simply move along and follow up with questions to you um, at another time. Uh, just real quick, I've been with Kepner Trigo 32 years. I primarily work with automotive, heavy equipment, and uh, OEMs in the supply chain. And you can see that uh, with my experience with KT, I've had an opportunity to work with Lonnie with a couple different clients uh, over my tenure with the firm, and we're really, really excited and appreciative to have you uh, join us this afternoon. Uh, I'll have Lonnie introduce himself in more detail in just a few moments. I wanted you to realize about KT, we are very excited about this event because we really are pioneers in critical thinking, and we've been in the business celebrating our 60th anniversary uh, this particular calendar year. And you can see that we've trained millions and millions of people really in our uh, problem solving and decision making processes. In that area, we really focus not only on training, but on capability and transfer of our skills to our clients. And we've encouraged that with much sustainability with our tools. We've had the good fortune to work with over 40% of Fortune 100 companies globally uh, throughout the world, and we've also dealt with over 300 to 350 of the Fortune 500 companies. We work with small, medium, and large uh, companies globally, and we also uh, share our ideas and our concepts in several different languages. Um, on the far right of this screen, you'll see that uh, we're really focused on return on investment and sustainable results. So not only do we focus on helping clients uh, solve problems, make decisions, and implement plans, but we do that always focused in areas of productivity improvements, quality enhancements, and cost reductions. And, and with that, I'd like to turn things over to Lonnie to talk about Kepner Trigo's root cause problem solving and why, through Lonnie's experience, he's been able to denote it as really the heart of a lean transformation. So, Lonnie, please pick up with the intro. Uh, very good. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I say good morning or good afternoon or good evening here. We've had I've had friends from China write in that they're going to join the seminar and people from South Africa and Brazil. And so all of you, I say good evening, good afternoon, and good morning as well. But um, our firm, Quality Consultants, is a small consulting firm here in El Paso, and our specialty is cultural change. The biggest cultural change mechanism out on the market is, is lean manufacturing, and that is where we've spent most of our, our energy recently. We specialize specifically in an area of lean that uh, not too many people dabble in, and that is people who have tried and failed, or people who have tried and are struggling. Uh, there's a surprisingly large number of those people out there. We focus on what I call lean done right. And uh, let me explain to you what I mean by lean done right. One of the best ways is to just look at a simple graphic. Uh, this is a graphic of a manufacturing plant. Uh, it was a value stream called the Theta cell. And in this cell, they were making headrests for Toyota. And uh, you'll notice on the graph, it's got SOP, that's start of production. And their key metric was uh, they wanted to get high labor productivity, and they needed to get to 100 headrests per person per day. Um, when they did that, uh, the profitability would be in the black. Unfortunately, they started out about 65, and after two years of struggling, and I mean really struggling, they did project after project, they had consultants come in, they did Six Sigma projects until they were tired of Six Sigma, they had visits from the home office, and yet after two years, they were at, at 80 headrests per person per day, 
And that's where they got us involved. And the very first thing we did is do some analysis on the line, and we then we locked up some engineers and managers in an office for a couple of days and redesigned the cell and did very much what you would call a major Kaizen event, or it could be called a Six Sigma project. At the end of the first week, the cell was producing 188 headrests per person per day. Just a phenomenal improvement. Uh, but that was done with with managers and engineers for the most part. Then we spent a good bit of time teaching the managers how to implement Kaizen done by the operator. And you'll notice there that over the next 10 months, their productivity went from 188 to 304 headrests per person per day. As soon as they broke the 100 barrier, of course, they were profitable. And when they got to 300, they were ecstatic. But that's what I mean by lean done right. Uh, first, you, you do Kaizen projects. That's one element of it. Uh, second, you get the, the management team involved and you create Kaizen projects uh, for, the, for the management, excuse me, for the, for the workers. Workers do individual Kaizens. And the third part of that is to get the support so that those individual Kaizens as well as the projects can be implemented. And by support, I mean management support. That's what I call lean done right. Um, now, you'll find that that story is a chapter in my book of lean refining. I'll introduce you to the book Lean Refining a little bit later, but it's a key chapter in it. And if you want more details on it, and there are plenty, uh, you can get that by getting a copy of that book. Now, in just a minute, we'll talk a little bit more about about uh, lean and and some of its issues but uh we'd like to get uh, some information from you and so we're going to move to a, a poll and we'd like to get your poll so please respond to this your question the question is are you using lean as a process and a product improvement methodology okay well we've got the poll results in and uh wow this is interesting about 20% of the people are all in. Uh, the biggest one, not surprisingly, is yes, but we have limited management commitment. That's a theme I hear frequently. Um, another one, yes, but we are just dabbling. Uh, that's another one I hear very frequently. Uh, the one I hate to hear is the next one. Uh, yes, we're talking about lean, but we're pretending to be lean. Um, I'm surprised here that we have almost nobody who tried but gave up. I guess that's a good sign, okay? Um, or you're using another improvement, improvement methodology or you're not using any improvement methodology at all. Uh, I think you'll find as we go through some of the slides, some of the things we talk to will uh, directly address these issues, the issues of management commitment and, and dabbling is, is uh, particularly interesting. So let's, uh, let's move forward and then get into why there are problems with lean and why in my firm we have a business working with firms that are having trouble doing lean. One of the problems is the very definition of lean. You'd think that as long as it's been around, um, there would be a, a, a close understanding of what it actually is. But the truth of it is there's as many definitions as there are people. Uh, however, what we use in my firm is that the, uh, the definition of lean is a replication of the Toyota production system. Okay? If you have any questions about what the replication of the Toyota production system is, the two people who actually worked in it, actually designed it, and actually wrote about it are Taiichi Ono and Fujiyo Cho. Uh, hundreds of other people have written about it, but those were the people, Ono and Cho, who really were, were instrumental in creating the system. Behind the Toyota production system, is the Toyota culture. And in 2001, Toyota wrote a book called The Toyota Way 2001. Now that's a 13 page pamphlet and amongst the people who are familiar with it, it's affectionately called The Green Book. Um, and it is not uh, a book, a hardback book of any length. A 13 page pamphlet written by Toyota about Toyota describing their culture. So 
how does how does this play out? When I say a replication of the Toyota production, what do I mean? Let's take a look at manufacturing from 30,000 feet, okay? It's real simple. It's about being better, faster, and cheaper. You want a better money-making machine that's a more secure workplace for your employees and the supplier of choice to your customers. That's what lean manufacturing is all about. Now, how do we do lean? Okay. If you go to Toyota, you'll find out that everything they do is based on two principles. So lean production is also based on that principle, those two principles, and that is creating a culture of continuous improvement and respect for people. Their whole 13-page green book addresses those two issues. Now, that's not specific to the production system. That's specific to all of Toyota. Now, that's, that's interesting. Uh, some people have difficulty digesting it, but how do you go about doing that? Okay. We have devised what's called the means to lean, okay? the method that you get to lean. And there's three steps to it. It's to problem solve your way to the ideal state. We're going to talk a lot about that, and that's where Kepner Trigo really comes into play. Okay? The second thing is through the total elimination of waste. This is where lean manufacturing distinguishes itself from various other forms of continuous improvement. The, the key is the elimination of waste. And here is the real clincher, using a fully engaged workforce. And if it's one thing that Toyota has has mastered it's how to get everybody involved from the ceo down through the c-suite to all their managers to all their supervisors to their team leaders to their operators everybody is engaged in the elimination as they try to problem solve their way to the ideal state now although that sounds fairly straightforward there's some issues and let's look at the size and the shape of some of those issues the truth of the matter is, in a lot of places, lean is not working very well. In fact, in an industry week survey from a couple of years back, they found out that 70% of all manufacturing that, that replied to the survey were using lean as a process improvement methodology. Okay? And on our survey, at least 70% of you have, have replied that same way. The problem with the survey was that few were really succeeding. Of that 70% that were using lean, less than 2% claimed they had fully achieved the results. 24% had said they had received significant results. The remainder were struggling, and that's the clear majority. And so just why is this? Why are so many people struggling to reach this? Okay. Now, in my book, How to Implement Lean Manufacturing, and again, I'll introduce that to you later, there's two chapters that I've addressed to this specific topic. Um, and in this slide, I've reduced it to the six biggies. As a matter of fact, the first chapter is the 10 lean killers, and the, the second chapter is the six rollout errors, how you can roll out a lean project and virtually guarantee that it will fail. Well, of the biggies, Number one is they think of lean as a tools issue. They think that if we get one dose of 5S and two doses of high junka and three doses of SMED and we throw in a little liter standard work and Kamishi by audits and we can become lean. Nothing could be further from the truth. Second is people are copying. Sometimes people call that benchmark, but if you try to copy some manufacturing system and apply it to your business, Sometimes you can make some headway, but for the most part, it's, a, it's a, not a winning strategy. The third thing is, and this is an absolute killer, they try using a staff-led or staff-taught program. And for you who, re, you who replied to the poll that, that you were having trouble getting management commitment, this ought to resonate with you. The staff people cannot lead. Ultimately, it leads to uh, severe conflicts of priorities. The fourth thing is they use a, what I call a bolt-on philosophy. In other words, they say, okay, we've got this operating system, and we'll go out and get a couple doses of lean, and we'll bolt it onto our operating system, and we'll make it much better. 
Well, the fundamental problem is that one of the underpinnings of lean is every one of these tools that we talk about using is designed to cause weaknesses to surface, to problems to come to the surface. And whether it's visual management or 5S boards, they're designed to highlight a problem. Well, as soon as you start implementing this, you highlight problems, you find many problems in your fundamental management system. The fifth of the five of the six biggies is they improperly integrate the management team. Okay? First, there's issues of management commitment. As soon as the management team goes out and hires a, a high energy staff guy to run the effort, uh, it almost dooms it. It must be management led. Okay? The second thing is just fundamental deficiencies in leadership. Uh, what I find amongst American managers or North American managers is there's a lot of really good managers. But those same managers who have leadership skills, who can lead a team through the changes that are necessary to implement a lean transformation are a much smaller group. And the sixth reason, the big one, the granddaddy of them all, is that so many management systems are completely dominated by metrics that focus on short-term bottom line thinking. And by short-term, I mean the quarterly stock report, the monthly budget. And by bottom line thinking, I mean financials. Lean is not short term. It's a balance between short term and long term. And lean is not just bottom line thinking. It's using a balanced scoreboard where you're, you're not only talking about finances, but you're talking about delivery. You're talking about quality. You're talking about innovation. You're talking about customer service. At, at the same time, you're thinking about not just short term finances, but long term finances. So summarizing, what I have found time and time again, it repeats itself to virtually every client I go to, that there's not a fundamental weakness in what the TPS is, okay? Rather, the weakness is twofold. It's do they really implement the TPS or do they eliminate or do they try to transform to some other, some other form of what disguises itself as lean? And the second thing is, not the, the, the TPS itself, but how do they go about executing it? It's really a matter of, of execution. Now, in just a minute, we'll discuss some more problem solving and how to reach the ideal state and go through the elements of the three elements of the means to lean. But uh, we've got some questions accumulating. And so, uh, Sam, do we have some more questions, some questions there that we could respond to? Yes, thank you, Lonnie. We actually have uh, several good questions um, that I, I want to share with the group, but uh, we only have limited time, so I'll start with one very quickly. Lonnie, you were just talking about short-term thinking and, uh, you know, short-term results, but interesting enough, uh, this question is as follows. It says, how can we measure lean at our sites? So obviously, we're in a situation as you know, where um, people need return on investment and they're spending time and money implementing lean initiatives, the real question is, how do they measure lean at their respective sites? What might be some key metrics or some recommendations you would have based on your experiences? Um, that's a really good question, Sam, and it's one that I get um, often. And the, the question really is kind of a funny question because um, you don't mention, you don't really mention, measure lean per se. You measure the results of lean. Um, and in so doing, um, people want to measure like, uh, should we be doing 40 Kaizens a month? No. Lean is not a new thing. It's a new way to do the things you need to do anyway. Okay. And so uh, we'll go through a slide in just a minute here, but uh, basically you measure your key metrics you find out where your gaps are, and then you work to drive your key metrics to the right place. You want to be better, faster, cheaper. And uh, and lean is a mechanism that will get you there. Do we have another one, Sam? Yeah, we've got time for one more now. And uh, this is another really good question. Perhaps you're going to get into this in more detail with the balance of the presentation. But the question is as follows. How do you make the KT methodology 
uh, fit the lean approach. Wow, I'm I'm not <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to how to answer that. I I guess to me it fits like a hand in a glove, and that is that uh, we're going to talk in just a second about the the point is that you problem solve your way to the ideal state, and there's a specific niche uh, that I particularly use. The KT problem solving in, yeah, and we'll we'll get to that. Maybe that will uh, that will answer itself in a subsequent slide. Okay, we'll follow up uh, with the other questions as time permits. But Lonnie, let's go back in and pick up where you left off with the presentation. Okay, and we were talking about problem solving our, our way to the ideal state. And uh, my buddy Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else. So just what is this thing called the ideal state? If you're going to problem solve yourself to the ideal state, what is it? Well, the ideal state in lean manufacturing would be a place with zero waste. You'd have one piece flow over zero distance. You'd have zero inventory. You'd have no whip, zero defects. No one's waiting. There'd be no excess movements, etc. Well, that's not something you're going to do today and maybe not something you're going to do ever, Okay. But the beauty of trying to reach the ideal state is the question is no longer what are we going to do. The questions become when are we going to do it, how are we going to do it, and in what order are we going to do it. Okay. And so people will say, well, the ideal state's unreachable. This, this makes no sense. Well, it says who? Well, we try to teach the, um, the, what we call the initiative mantra. And if you start where you are, you use what you have, and you do what you can, and pretty soon we call this the no more excuses rule. And as soon as you start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can, you can set up target conditions, and, and pretty soon you'll be surprised at the huge amount of, of progress that you make. Uh, I find that the, the weakness in most uh, lean implementations is not a lack of skill or a lack of tools. I find it's a lack of initiative. Okay. But how, how do we get there? Well, it all starts with problem solving to reach the ideal state. Okay. Now, we talked about the ideal state, but what about problem solving? Okay. Well, in, in problem solving, you always start with what's your destination? Where do we want to go? Okay. And, and in lean, we want to get better, faster, and cheaper. And so once you looked at your destination, you compare it to where you are, now you've developed some gaps, okay? Now, it, once you've got those gaps, now you've created a natural development for structured problem solving, okay? You prioritize these gaps, and, and the gaps usually take three forms. One is there's some future issues, and the kepner trigo methodology to, to resolve that is a potential problem analysis. You have some gaps that are simple decisions to make. And, and the kepner trigo response to that is decision analysis. And then you have gaps that are actually problems. And problems are present issues of concern, excuse me, where the root cause needs to be removed for progress to be made. And the, the kepner trigo attack to that is through problem analysis. And we're going to go through two or three or four problem analysis as we go through further. So we've got this list of concerns, potential concerns, future concerns, present concerns. Um, how do we go about handling them? Okay. Well, the workhorse that we teach is the six, six, six questions of continuous improvement. Years ago, I was taught these at a, at a training that was called practical problem solving taught by Toyota. Okay. And they taught the first actually five questions, okay? And the first question is, what is the present condition? In other words, where are we? What's the desired future condition, okay? That is the, the, the place we're trying to reach. That's getting closer to the ideal state. What is preventing us from reaching the desired condition? What are the impediments that we're facing? Question number four is, what is something we can do right now to get closer to the desired condition? Now, as you read that, that is less than subtle in what we want to do. We're, we're not looking for great big monstrous projects that are, you know, save the world. We're trying to do something right now to make progress. Question number five is, 
is the hypothesis test on, on what you're going to do. When you do whatever you're going to do in question four, what should you expect? What will happen? How much of it will happen? And when will we be able to go to the, to the line and see it? Okay. And then the sixth question is a wrap-up. Once we have finished this project, what have we learned? It's part of the, the learn, do, reflect principle that Toyota teaches. That's what I call the workhorse of problem solving and lean. Okay. But there's all kinds of other problem solving techniques. Depending upon the interesting industry you're in, you might be involved in, you might want Shannon tools. Uh, Six Sigma statistical tools have some powerful applications. The five whys has its niche. There's others. But when you have the toughest and when you have the largest of the problems and you have the most consequential of the problems, I rely on the, the techniques that I learned in my Kepner Trigo training. Uh, the heart of the method in Kepner Trigo is problem analysis. You'll see over here they got a situation appraisal, and the, the first item is problem analysis to take care of problems. And remember, we have some concerns that are decisions, and we have some potential problems or future problems, okay? But problem analysis is the approach to better understand the problem, okay? And it, we, we use the four dimensions of what is the problem, where is the problem, when is the problem, and how much is the problem, the extent, to do what I call box in the problem. This identifies to a great extent where the problem is. And in just a second, we're going to learn about where it is not. Problem analysis is, is great, and these four dimensions help you identify and surround the problem. However, there's a beauty to Kepner Trigo that I learned that I think is far and away the most powerful aspect of all the problem analysis, and that is the is not questions. In other words, you don't just ask what is the problem. You ask what could be the problem but is not. Where could the problem be but it is not? When could the problem be occurring but is not, etc. And so you go through an is, is not analysis. Okay, to, to show the beauty of particularly where is the problem, I want to tell you a story of, I call it the Ben Pins case. And it, it came close to driving me crazy. Um, the situation was this, we were working with a, a, a maquila in, in, in Juarez, Mexico, and they were making a very sophisticated circuit board that was the actuator to the airbags in a uh, in an automobile. And so it had this clever little accelerometer on it that was smart enough to distinguish between just hitting the curb too hard and a real crash. And uh, it would activate the airbags under a crash and not when you just bumped into the curb. But on it, there was a connector. And this connector had 24 pins in it. I, I still don't understand where all the connections were for, but, but there were 24 pins. And we had this problem that we were getting zero mile returns. And for you in the oil, in the auto industry, you understand that zero mile returns are the returns that happen at the assembly line. And they would try to plug in this circuit board into the mating, uh, into the female adapter on the car, and it wouldn't fit because the pins were bent. And we were and we worked, and we simulated, and we analyzed, and, and we went through Kepner Trio top to bottom, left to right, and we could not duplicate these failures. Um, and so in going through the is not analysis, I was able to, and spending some time in the Chrysler plant, I was able to conclude that the defect happened somewhere between the final tester where all the pins had to be engaged, and putting it in the box, a distance of three feet. We were getting maybe one defect about out of every 50,000 units that we were making, which is about a month's supply, but we absolutely could not find the source of it. So out of frustration, I just parked myself down at the packing station and watched, and I was ready to sit there for a full week. Well, luckily, late in the first day, something happened. And what happened was the tugger that was bringing material by came by, hit the box that they were putting these 
circuit boards in, and the box fell on the floor. So I, I ran over. I watched what was happening. The guy picked up the egg crate container, and he put it back in the box. And I noticed that he had put the egg crate container in differently than it was to begin with. And lo and behold, we were able to then simulate uh, a defect in the pins. And what would happen was the egg crate container had moved enough that now the egg crate container could actually reach inside of the of the pins and deform them. Uh, we did a pokey yoke on the egg crate so it, it couldn't be changed again. And lo and behold, we solved the problem. But we solved it because we kept asking the question, where could this be happening but is not? And we narrowed it down to this little three-foot dimension in the plant out of the, the 1,900 miles that it traveled in transit and the 120 feet it traveled in the plant and the, and the 40 feet it traveled in the Chrysler plant. And we found this one little three-foot area and were able to diagnose what the problem was. But only because we just kept rigorously as, asking the is and the is not question. Which, which brings me to a, an issue that I like to talk about frequently. I've actually written a couple of articles about this, but what are the problems with problem solving? And strangely enough, I found out that the problems with problem solving usually are not finding solutions. By and large, I find out that 90% of the time, we find problems, we fail to find problems, because we don't properly define the problem and or we fail to use we, we fail to use a structured disciplined approach to attacking the problem. Now, unfortunately this is news to many. They're looking for sophisticated ways to come up with solutions and I find that that's not where the issue is. Okay? Let's take a look at the case of the fouling heat exchangers. What we thought was a repeating issue and I was approached by the plant manager, and uh, he knew that I was familiar with, with Kepner Trigo problem solving, and we were doing a lean sigma transition at a petroleum refinery. And he said, Lonnie, I'm familiar that, I understand you're familiar with Kepner Trigo problem solving. We've got a problem that we've got some heat exchangers that are fouling. We think we know what's going on, but I'm not so sure. Uh, and the problem is we're headed for a premature shutdown, and we want to avoid that at all costs. So he said, can you put together a group of people to, to resolve it? So we did, and we met the next morning. The next morning, I asked the, the lead engineer, the lead process engineer, to give me a rundown. And he told me that, that these heat exchangers would foul, and the fouling would play it out on the top of the catalyst bed uh, of the next, uh, next operation. And pretty soon, the catalyst bed would have a, a high delta P, and then they would have to shut down, vacuum off the top of the catalyst bed, do a quick and dirty uh, cleaning of the heat exchangers and start back up. Well, they had made some process changes. They didn't think they were going to have this problem in the future, and that option was no longer available. We couldn't shut down. They had made enough process changes that that was no longer a viable option. But everybody believed that that's what the problem really was. Okay. So in the problem-solving session, we said, okay, well, let's look at the data. Okay. And, and here is some of the data they had. They had charts, tables, and graphs coming out their ear. I put nine on this slide, that's all I could fit. They have another 15 slides with tons of more data. And I said, okay, now let's write a simple problem statement. Before we were done writing the problem statement, it became clear that we didn't understand the problem. And, and here we are drowning in data, but we were starving for information. So we started filling out the, the Kepner Trigo problem solving problem analysis, asking the what, the where, the when, and the extent, and not only the is and the is not. In the midst of this, I just have to ask a simple question, and I said, okay, if heat exchanger fouling were, were routine, what would it look like? What is the should be state? There's enough that really hadn't been asked before. And so we looked at this one graph, and you can see this little slight horizontal line right here. And instead, we put a great big bold line there. And that was the should-be state. And then I 
said, okay, now let's draw a line in where we are today. And you can see that follows the heat exchanger fouling. And immediately, you can see at the intersection of that point, if you look down below, somebody said, well, son of a gun, that's where the sublimation temperature crosses and, and we're no longer subliming material. And in fact, it's plating out. So at that point, we began to understand what the problem was. Before the day was out, they went over and, and raised the inlet temperature enough to get above the sublimation temperature. And because we had very good instrumentation on the catalyst bed, we could find out that we, we started to correct the fouling by causing some of the material that had, had laid down to sublime. Now, here's a classic example of, of two things. One is we thought we understood the problem. And, and we really did not understand the problem and started until we started looking at the data. And let me take you back one slide here, just a second. Pardon me. A psychologist I was reading about wrote this statement down. He said, I'll see it when I believe it. Now, most people, when they read that, they read it in their mind the other way around. I'll believe it when I see it. Okay. But these people could not see the problem because they didn't believe they had a different mechanism. They believed they had the same old mechanism that they had before. And then once we defined the problem, man, it was 90% solved. We were out of the woods. Uh, the third example was a, a lean transformation. And one of their key metrics was to improve plant overall equipment effectiveness, OEE. And they started out, and they were making, making some reasonable progress, but then we had a breakthrough. And in this plant, what they do is they make foam products, mostly seats for automobiles. And in a minute, I'm going to show you the, the graph that we used to, on one of our first problems to solve. And the seat that we were talking about was the back bench seat to a Chevrolet Impala. And uh, the mold is about the size of a bathtub. But um, I asked a question. I said, well, where might the defects be but are not? And they said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, on this, on this mold, do the defects appear at some particular place on the, on, the, on the part? And they said, I don't know. I said, well, let's ask another question. Uh, do you have multiple molds? And they said, yeah, but they're all identical. We make the first mold. Uh, it's brought here to the plant. We debug it, we, and then the, the mold manufacturer copies everything. Our molds are fundamentally identical. Um, and quite frankly, they believed that, so they couldn't see that they were actually different. So I said, can we, can we separate the data? And lo and behold, they prepared this chart. Now, initially, this stuff over here for mold three was not there, but you can see they've segregated the, the production for mold one, mold two, and mold three. And this is a standard P chart, as you might expect. And what we found out was on the line, mold one and mold two were running, mold three was not. But during lunch, we went and got a, a forklift, grabbed mold three, and brought it over to the line and compared it to mold two. And lo and behold, we could find some differences. So we modified mold three to match mold two, and then you notice it goes to zero defects. Well, later we took mold one off the line and repaired it. But that question, where could it be happening but it is not, opened up the whole, whole avalanche of diamonds that allowed them to, to make the progress that they were making. Um, now, we, we've talked a little bit about problem solving. We've given you a couple of examples of six questions of continuous improvement, some of the, the Kepner Trigo stuff. Uh, we'd like to get a little bit more information from you. And so we've got a poll here on problem solving. What type of problem solving do you do? Okay. So if you would go through this and check all that apply to the question, do you have a structured problem solving methodology? Okay. As, as I look at this data, uh, the only thing that I find that's kind of discouraging is that 20% of you don't have a structured problem solving methodology. Um, if you want to implement lean, you need to get into problem solving up to your hips, okay? Um, 
Yes, we have it, but 30% of it only used by engineers and managers. Uh, seems like teaching is an issue. Um, problems repeat. And yet only 10% say you have a structured approach and it's used on all problems by everyone. Uh, this is not different than I see a lot of other places, but I think it gives you a point of, of reference. If you want to implement Toyota production, if you want to implement lean manufacturing as the Toyota production system is, is implemented, this, this bottom answer of yes, it is used on all problems by everybody, that needs to be like 90%, okay? And and it, is it widely taught? That needs to be 90 to 100%, okay? Those are two areas that I would say um, this group could really focus on and get some real mileage out of that. Okay, well, let's, let's move on to the, to the presentation. And one of the things that, uh, that I really find that is really incredibly interesting about problem solving, particularly people who use a structured, disciplined approach, is that it's a training mechanism. And you find out that even when you're not locked up in a conference room with a Kepner Trigo problem analysis in front of you with a group of people to brainstorm a problem, people who have used structured, disciplined problem solving are just faster, clearer thinkers. They're able to solve problems and they're able to, to implement them in, a, in an integrated fashion. Um, it's, a, it's a training tool that is incredibly powerful. Um, and if you spend a great deal of time, like I did, whoops, I lost the slide, there we go, uh, in the petroleum business, and uh, you're in the control room and you've got a problem facing you, uh, sometimes you just don't have time to get all the people together. You need to act, you need to act quickly, and those people who are the faster and the clearer thinkers are the ones who are going to going to keep their plants up and running. Um, that that ends the, the formal presentation, the content. I've got a couple of final words that I'd like to I'd like to give to you. Uh, first is um, you can check out my website and it's www.qc-ep.com. There's several uh, features on there that might be useful to you. There's a library, my listing with um, I think it's approaching 700 books on it now, and each book has a, has a summary, and they're subdivided, so if you want to find books on designed experimentation or on cultural analysis, you'll find a, a, a wide range of books there. You'll also find over 50 published white papers. Uh, most of them deal with the human side of lean. Okay? There's even several about consulting, and uh, since I suspect the majority of you might be change agents, you might want to check out the one called Change Agents Beware. Weirdness, Survival, and Success, and uh, and read about the Perceived Weirdness Index. You might find that interesting. And there's also a pull-down menu on lean manufacturing, uh, giving you many forms for problem-solving, leader standard work. Second, uh, all the examples that are covered in this presentation are more fully developed and explained in one of my, my two books. Uh, I wrote How to Implement Lean Manufacturing. It was first published in 2009 and then later published in 2015, it was second edition. And that book was an Amazon number one bestseller for weeks. Uh, I recently, in, in May of 2017, published Lean Refining, How to Improve Productivity in the Oil Business. I did that for two reasons. One is that many, many people have trouble connecting lean manufacturing to the continuous process industries. And there should not be. The principles are precisely the same. It's just that so much in the literature is written about what I call the world of widgets. The second thing is I wanted to connect my 20 years with Chevron uh, with my 28 years of consulting and, um, and share that with, with people as well. And, not, and last but not least, I make an offer to each one of you, and that is that anyone who has ever been a student of mine can continue to be a student of mine if they so choose. And so having completed that, this webinar, you now are a student of mine. 
Uh, hence, I'm available for ad hoc questions, teaching, mentoring. Um, just email me or call. And um, by the way, if you want to talk about soccer, that's on the agenda too. So uh, I wish you well. This has been incredibly enjoyable. And uh, I think now we'll turn this over to Sam. Uh, we've got some time here left over for some questions. Thank you, Lonnie. A couple more questions. Uh, based on the poll that the participants just uh, shared their answers with, almost 28% said that the structured problem solving they use is only for engineering, supervisors, and managers, and it's around productivity and process problems. And another 20% said there's no structured problem solving used in their organization. Um, can you talk briefly about KT's problem solving methodology and why you feel it's so important, as I know you've referenced in your books, about having total employee involvement and empowering all employees to be involved in a structured problem solving process like KT, rather than just no process at all or just select functions within a company yeah i i think i mean there's no question about it if you look at the toyota production system um and and you you want to have a lean manufacturing system that mimics the toyota production system you have to have people involved in problem solving that's just as basic as it gets and and there is nothing that i think that i have used that teaches the structure and the integration better than following the, the Kepner Trigo methodology. Uh, Kepner Trigo also has a, I don't want to sound like I'm advertising Kepner Trigo, but maybe I am here, but um, they also have a structured problem solving uh, for the line worker. Uh, it follows the same type of principles um, and it's uh, it's equally effective. But I, I just think the bottom line issue is if if you are serious about lean manufacturing, that's where you start. You start with problem solving. And uh, I teach, the first thing I teach is the six questions of continuous improvement. That's what we teach at, at class one, day one. To build off that response, um, th this question says, are you familiar with Dr. Deming as the background to Toyota's success? And obviously you just talked about Toyota in your last response. This question goes on to say, if you are familiar, do you believe that Deming's principles are essentially the same as the Toyota way. And I thought maybe you could talk about that a little bit in regards to problem solving and Kepner Trigo. Um, and by the Toyota way, I presume who asked that question meant the, the Toyota way, the 13 page green book. Well, let me, let me answer it two ways. There's a, there's a fairly famous book called the Toyota way, but um, first uh, Deming's fundamental principle contribution to improvement was management and if you read his his writings he talks about his 14 obligations of management and i can say this about the the toyota way 2001 and toyota's culture is that um i find no contradictions whatsoever between the toyota way 2001 and what dr Deming had wrote, written um now they talk about slightly different topics the toyota one excuse me, the Toyota Culture 2001 addresses the culture of the Toyota Corporation. And, and Deming is more addressing the role of management. Now, he goes beyond the role of management, no question about it, but that's the fundamental heart and soul of what he has to say. Now, in terms of any contradictions between them, no, I don't find any contradictions at all, but they do cover a slightly different topical matter. Okay, um, I think I have time for maybe one or two more to squeeze in here, Lonnie. Um, yeah, let's given do it. That we've, thank you. Given that we've talked today about root cause problem solving, the heart of a lean transformation, um, this question is, it seems like most organizations start with 5S. What's wrong with that, or is there anything wrong with that? Um, well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. Uh, not much. But 5S is a very specific type of, of problem solving. And uh, people review view 5S and they think, well, it's really easy. You just ask why, you know. Well, the problem with using 5S is that people have to be very skilled and very understanding 
of the subject matter. Because basically you're asking, if this is the effect, what's causing it? Every why question takes you one step further, further back in the cause and effect. So you have to understand the cause and effect. Uh, if you don't understand the cause and effect, then you can't be effective in 5Y. So it's not as simple as it appears on the surface. And as a matter of fact, to do 5Y problem solving and do it well, you have to be an expert in the field of what you're talking about. And uh, so is there anything wrong with it? No. Is it a good place to start teaching people? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a powerful tool. But um, if, if you don't have a clear understanding of cause and effect, 5Y very soon just fritters out. Um, and I, I'm just amazed at, at how powerful it is and how complicated it really is compared to how simple it would appear. All right, Lonnie, um, thanks much. I think I'm going to ask one last question, and then I'm going to turn things back over to Jill at Industry Week. Um, I promise everyone on this call, this really is a question from one of the participants. It's not a question that, that Lonnie or I generated. In fact, all the questions today have been from the participants. But, Lonnie, given your firm, Quality Consultants, and our consulting firm, Kepner Trigo, and the way we work together collaboratively, um, very interesting question here. How long should an outside consultant come in to train management for best results on implementation of lean? And can you give a timeline of a lean uh, journey slash and or destination? Uh, well, I, I think as, as far as giving a timeline, no. That's going to depend upon... Um, not so much the industry and not so much the work, but two things. Number one is physically how fast can the place change? And number two, emotionally how fast can the place change? Um, I have seen places that are in absolute dire stress. Uh, survival is facing them square in the face, and they make massive, massive changes and, and go from not very lean at all to becoming a, a top flight performer in maybe 18 to 24 months. That, by the way, is the exception. Okay? I have also seen companies dabble with it for 10 years and still be um, uh, still be deficient in a variety of ways. Now, how long should you have a consultant? Okay, you should have an advisor on staff forever. Okay, the Japanese they call it a sensei, and there's an advisor there, and there's a reason for it. And uh, if nothing else, he needs to be there to advise the manager. But um, how long you need a consultant holding your hand and teaching you the tools and that type of stuff, um, creating a structure for you, depends upon how long, how fast you can change. But the w one thing that a, a good sensei or a good consultant or a good teacher will bring is an outside set of eyes that can observe and see things that people who are within the culture cannot see. So I, I know companies that, that have retained a, a sensei for like 25 years, okay? And they swear by it, okay? Um, the, the question gets to be, how do you free yourself of, of, um, of becoming dependent upon them and, and creating your, your own skill inventory, which is the real, the real thing that you want to be able to do. But the, the, the outside set of eyes will still bring observations of your culture and your competition that an inside set of eyes uh, can't bring. Well, and just to build off that, Lonnie, I would close by saying I recently had a conversation with a CEO, and one of his statements was we need management support just to sustain and implement the successful results, and in fact it needs to be part of the culture and the DNA of one's organization. So I certainly support yeah. um, your comments and those of uh, the recent CEO that I talked with. Thank everyone for their time and attention today working with quality consultants and Kepner Trigo.